OK. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Huck. I'm, uh, I work at Google on storage encryption, and I'm going to be talking about uh, white block ciphers in Linux. So in storage encryption, there are two primary challenges. Um, the first is that the encryption modes that we have to use uh, are required to be length preserving. This means that the ciphertext has to be the same length as the plain text. Um, this is important because we want to make sure that an encrypted disk can store the same amount of data as an unencrypted disk. Um, unfortunately, uh, a length preserving cipher cannot also provide auth authenticity. So, um, if we use a length preserving cipher, we can't automatically detect when our disk has been tampered with. Um, the second challenge in storage encryption is that um, we can't store randomized initialization vectors on the disk. So um, instead, we have to reuse other known data, such as the sector number as the initialization vector or the logical block number as the initialization vector. Um, and this causes problems because um, if we write to a specific sector on disk, um, both times when it's encrypted, it's going to um, have used the same initialization vector. So if an attacker is to acquire um, the, uh, like a snapshot of our encrypted disk at multiple different times, they're going to acquire ciphertexts of our encrypted disk that use the same initialization vector. Um, so essentially, they're going to acquire um, the encryption of specific sectors that use the same initialization vector when encrypting. And with many encryption modes, this reduces the confidentiality that we have. So uh, for example, with AES XTS mode, which is the common mode that is used for disk encryption, um, if I flip a single bit, on my disk sector, it only corresponds to a 16-byte change uh, in the ciphertext. Um, so if I have two plain texts with very long common substrings, um, or I guess 16-byte uh, long common substrings, then if I encrypt them with the same initialization vector, they're going to have um, uh, common substrings in their ciphertexts as well. And so this is a problem if we're encrypting uh, disks and an attacker recovers two ciphertexts from the same sector, and those um, ciphertexts had plain texts that were somewhat related, um, and that maybe like uh, somebody changed like a few bytes in that sector. They can an attacker can essentially see that only a few bytes in that sector have been changed and they can kind of analyze access patterns, write patterns to the disk. Um, so for example, let's say I download this top image here um, to my disk, and then at some later time, I edit the image to add this hello text. So if an attacker takes a snapshot of my disk at both times, uh, independently, the snapshots look completely random. But if I were to zor them together, um, an attacker can see that there's like this hello text there. And this would allow an attacker to say, guess that this sector on my disk um, has a bitmap image in it, and I've edited the bitmap image to say hello. Um, a similar attack works in reverse. So an attacker can, this attack only works because um, the attacker can see edits at like a 16 byte granularity, so they can pretty much see exactly where I've written to the disk. Or not exactly, but fairly precisely see where I've written to the disk. Um, and a similar attack works in reverse, where an attacker can corrupt 16 bytes at a time on my disk. So they can um, flip a bit in my encrypted disk. And when I decrypt that, uh, only 16 bytes of my disk are going to be corrupted. Um, similarly, if they acquire two copies or two snapshots of my disk, they can cut and paste 16-byte blocks between the copies to kind of create like a Frankenstein file between the two versions of the encrypted disk. Um, and then when I decrypt it, I see that uh, I, I basically get like a mixed up file. Um, and 
This is, again, a problem because we don't have authenticated encryption. We can't have authenticated encryption with, with length preser uh, preservation. So we can't automatically detect that this has happened. Uh, we can only really detect it because our data now looks wrong. Um, so another attack that we could do similar uh, with the disk encryption is say we were running like uh, an SSH server and we have an attacker that has physical access to our disk. Um, and let's say that they've, uh, they know on our disk uh, where the SSH config file is and they know, um, so in this server we have password authentication disabled um, and they want to turn password authentication on. So they know which line corresponds to password authentication on our disk. Um, and let's say that they just flip a bit uh, in that line on our disk. With a one in 256 chance, they have um, that the first character, when we now decrypt that randomized plain text, will be uh, a pound sign. So with a one in 256 chance, they will have just uh, corrupted that line and then commented out the corruption. Um, so when we restart the service, um, password authentication will now be uh, allowed. So how do, we, how do we fix these problems? So I already said that these problems are kind of impossible to fix without authenticated encryption, and we can't use authenticated encryption because we want length preservation. So instead, what we can do is we can increase the granularity at which an attacker must work. So instead of allowing the attacker to work at a 16-byte granularity, we make them work at a 4096-byte granularity. So what we do is we essentially um, change the granularity from being a 16 bytes to the entire sector. Um, so to do this, what we want is called a wide block cipher. So um, narrow block ciphers like um, ASXTS, for example, um, kind of work on 16 bytes at a time. Uh, whereas with a wide block cipher, we want a cipher that works on 4096 bytes at a time. So if I flip a bit in the plain text, the entire cipher text is going to be uh, randomized in a completely unpredictable way. Uh, and the, the reverse should also be true. If I flip a byte in the cipher text, the entire plain text should be unpredictably randomized. And if we do this, we have the property that IV reuse is, is now safe. Um, if I have two messages with the same IV, um, even if the entire message matches all except for one bit, the ciphertexts are going to be completely random, so an attacker can't correlate these ciphertexts at all. Um, and we also get the uh, kind of an, uh, an authentication guarantee, not, not quite. Um, we, we get that if an attacker modifies some bit on our disk, um, the entire sector is going to change. And the idea is that we're much more likely to detect if uh, 4096 bytes of our disk are corrupted rather than 16 bytes of our disk are corrupted. And so if we try this attack again uh, with a wide block cipher, um, the attacker can really only see that those blocks uh, have been modified. They can't tell, uh, since the granularity is so much larger, they can't tell that I've added like the hello text there. They just see that um, the, the sectors have been changed. Now, uh, I said that we wanted to use wide block ciphers, but to be more specific, um, a cryptographer would call this a tweakable PRP, or tweakable pseudo-random permutation. Um, so essentially, it's a block cipher where the block size is the sector size. Um, it accepts a key and a value that's similar to an initialization vector, but it can be variable length, uh, and that's called a tweak. Um, and you can see that this is kind of an ideal cipher for, um, for disk encryption. I just put in the block, and I put in the sector number, and I get out an encrypted block. So a similar problem um, exists in encryption for file names in file system encryption. Um, in modern file systems, uh, we use hash trees to do directory entry lookups. So 
uh, essentially we hash the file name in order to look up the directory entry. And if we're using an encrypted directory, um, we can't store a hash of the plain text file name. So we need to instead use uh, the encrypted file name to do this lookup. Um, and ideally, we would use a unique initialization vector for um, every file name. But unfortunately, that would require us to first look up that initialization vector, encrypt the uh, file name, hash it, and look it up in the hash tree. So that we can't look up the initialization vector because uh, we haven't looked up the directory entry yet. So what we do instead is we just use a directory initialization vector where every file name in the directory uses the same, uh, same initialization vector, and then we encrypt with that, hash it, and look it up in the hash tree. And so let's say I had these two file names in the same directory um, with AESCTS CVC mode, which is what's commonly used for file name encryption. Um, since these file names have a 16-byte uh, common substring, their ciphertexts are also going to have a common substring. So uh, an attacker can sort of correlate that these files are related in some way, um, which they shouldn't be able to do. Uh, and if you, if you notice, this is kind of the same problem that we had before um, with disk encryption. Um, and we use a very similar construction to fix it. We use, um, the, the, only, the main difference is that uh, for file name encryption, we have variable length um, messages. Whereas with disk encryption, we had a fixed length 4096 byte message. So for this, we use what's called a tweakable SPRP, or tweakable super pseudo random permutations. And this, you can think of this kind of as an infinite set of wide block ciphers or an infinite set of tweakable PRPs, um, one for each possible input length, and they're all mutually secure. So if I have um, an input of length 16, and I encrypt that, and I append one byte to that, and I encrypt that 17 byte message, the 16 and 17 byte message should look uh, completely different so that they can't be correlated. And what you might notice is that if we have a tweakable SPRP, we can easily implement a tweakable PRP. So we can easily get um, the disk encryption stuff if we have the file name encryption stuff. Um, and we, we just do this by fixing the input size. So say I have a tweakable SPRP, I just fix the input size to 4096 bytes, and now I have a tweakable PRP of 4096 bytes. Um, Interestingly, also, we can use um, tweakable SPRPs to make authenticated encryption. So what we do is we um, pad the input with uh, some fixed number of zeros, um, and we encrypt normally. And then when we decrypt, we just check whether those zeros are still all intact. And if an attacker were to try to modify our ciphertext, it's going to randomize those zeros. So when we try to decrypt, um, those zeros will no longer be intact, and we can know that um, an attacker has like modified our message in transit. Um, we can also use this to make authenticated encryption with associated data, just by uh, passing the associated data in uh, with the tweak. So uh, the advantages that a tweakable SPRP has over um, something like AES-XTS mode, is first of all, that uh, tweak reuse or IV reuse is safe and that they're less malleable. So um, an attacker kind of has to work on a 4096 byte granularity rather than a 16 byte granularity. Um, there's also the advantage that tweakable SPRPs are useful outside of disk encryption as well. For example, Tor is looking at using um, tweakable SPRPs. Um, Whereas XTS mode is like strictly limited to disk encryption. If you're not familiar with disk encryption, you probably have never heard of it. Um, and then also tweakable SPRPs are uh, cryptographically cleaner. If you're a cryptographer, um, AES XTS and AES CTS CVC mode um, aren't great because they're 
encryption modes that were kind of modified uh, last minute to work for disk encryption. Um, so the disadvantages of using a tweakable SPRP is that there's some amount of performance loss. So the extra diffusion um, from 16 bytes to 4096 bytes requires more work in our cipher. Um, and in a lot of tweakable SPRPs, this is somewhere between uh, two and four times uh, as much work. In the specific cipher that I'm going to be talking about later, um, it's around 1.7 times, which is, as far as I know, the, the best currently. So the other disadvantages is that there's few fully specified algorithms, and then there's even fewer implementations of actual algorithms. Um, as far as tweakable SPRPs in the Linux kernel go, there's already one in there. It's called Adianthem, um, and it is used for CPUs that do not have accelerated cryptography instructions. Um, if you have cryptogra uh, accelerated cryptography instructions, AES XTS would be much faster than Adianthem. Um, there's another mode called AES uh, HCounter2, which is what I've been working on. Um, and it has recently been accepted, uh, and it is uh, intended for use on CPUs that do have accelerated cryptography instructions. So here is AES uh, HCounter2. It uses two rounds of hashing and one round of encryption, and uh, that is why it is somewhat slower than AES XTS. It is because AES XT, uh, XTS only has one round of encryption. The two rounds of hashing are what slows us down. Um, the hashing here is um, uh, called polyval. It's from um, AES GCM SIV. It's a hashing mode that's reused from there. Um, if you're familiar with AES GCM, uh, polyval is basically ghash, but uh, rewritten to be optimized for little Indian CPUs. Um, and then the layer of encryption is uh, a mode called uh, X-Counter. So X-Counter mode is very similar to AES counter mode, if you know what that is. And it's a stream cipher that uses ZOR rather than addition, like counter mode. Um, and it's also optimized for little Indian CPUs. Um, and something I should note about H-Counter 2 is that uh, it's a construction, so it's uh, not a cipher in the same way that AES is. Um, you base the construction off of another um, encryption mode. So let's say I used AES as my underlying block cipher. There's a mathematical proof that says if AES is uh, secure, then H counter two with AES is also secure. Um, and that proof uses uh, some argument using uh, polynomial, uh, polynomial root counting. And so in terms of performance, this is a graph of the performance with H counter 2 uh, in blue and XTS in orange. Um, and the X axis is the input length in bytes and the Y axis is uh, essentially the cipher speed. So it's cycles per byte. Um, and you can see that H counter 2 is slower than XTS mode, which is what we expect. Um, and this graph isn't super helpful. I think this one is much better. Um, this is the ratio of speed between H counter 2 and AES uh, XTS mode. And you can see that as the input length gets larger, um, the speed slowdown converges to around 1.7. That red line is 1.7 times as slow. And what we want to use this for in the kernel is, first of all, for file name encryption, where performance doesn't quite matter as much. And then also for file contents or disk encryption, depending on um, what sort of trade-offs you have between security and performance. If you're a very security-focused organization, maybe you want to use a tweakable SPRP. And that is it. Uh, thank you for listening. Yep. So um, my question is, have, have you run the, um, these um, performance metrics against the authenticated mode? Uh, what do you mean by the authenticated mode? Like, 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the um, the performance would essentially just be as if you added um, like some number of bytes onto uh, the input length here. So if you wanted to do authenticated encryption of 4096 bytes, um, the speed of that would just be uh, encryption for 4096 plus 16. Um, so you would just kind of extend this graph out like 16 bytes. Um, so it should be just as performant um, for the AEAD. Right, so. It has a specific length. Yeah. Can you use this an equivalence type length with this mode? I think it's equivalent to global security. Yeah, so um, you would just, like ASGCM, the tag is 16 bytes, right? So the, um, the, the tag would just be the 16 bytes off the end of the cipher, basically. Um, and again, like ASGCM mode, I don't know. I assume it's probably similar uh, in speed. Actually, it's probably not similar in speed to XTS mode. It's probably like uh, H counter 2 is probably 1.3 times as slow because GCM also does a G hash. Um, but yeah, the, the tag is essentially just, um, I don't know, you, you just take like the last few bytes off and use those as a tag. Um, and yeah, you, you can use the same amount. Like you can variably figure out how many zeros you want to add depending on um, how authenticated you want your encryption to be. The more zeros you have, the lower probability that an adversary will be able to um, like modify your message and have it still um, be correct. And I guess my last question is, is this coming to the Android platform? Are we getting authenticated encryption on Android? So it's, it's not fully authenticated. We want to use this for file name encryption currently um, because file name encryption currently, uh, uh, yeah, file name encryption currently, like uh, the message or the, it, it sort of leaks some amount of data um, about your file names if your file names are a su uh, sufficient length. And we'd prefer that not to happen. Um, I don't think that we plan to actually use it for file name or disk encryption on Android, but um, if other people want to use it for file name or disk encryption, they, they could, I guess. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, the performance slowdown is fairly significant because it's like 1.7 times as slow for your disk. Uh, it's the encryption overhead. That's a very different thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Android has. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Calcro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote the original Android encryption. Oh, nice. So yeah. I worked at Darth Vader and Paul Crowley. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I guess uh, the you know, way that I think about the platform is, is we have the inline encryption capability. Yep. It cannot, right. That's why we want to use it for file name encryption and not file contents encryption or uh, just full disk encryption. Because um, as far as I know, the uh, inline encryption does not uh, work for the file names. Sure, I mean, if you have more questions. <laughs> sure. Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, then uh, maybe I'll sit down. <laughs>
Thank you.